Just do it! Don't let your dreams be dreams. Yesterday, you said tomorrow. So just do it! Make your dreams come true! Nothing is impossible! No, what are you waiting for? Do it! Yes, you can! Just do it! If you're tired of starting over, stop giving up. Just do it! Actual cannibal Shia LaBeouf! Okay, everybody, hi, and welcome to another episode, a monthly episode of the Ankle Cast. I'm Big Anklevich, your host for today's festivities. Um, I'm on my way to work. Uh, unfortunately, it's a Sunday. Today is actually the 31st of May, so for once in my ever, um, I'm ahead of schedule. I could have this thing ready to go and actually hit right on June 1st, which would be neato, right? Um, so anyways, yeah, I'm here. Uh, I'm not really going to talk a whole lot about what I did last month because it was little. Um, I'm going to talk about what I've got in store for myself. And that is Dupo... What did we call it? Dupo Rimo? Do no Rimo? Do no Rimo, I don't know. <laughs> we had some kind of a name for it that Rish said by chance, but uh, I think it might have been Dupo Rimo. But that doesn't make sense, really. Do no Rimo does, though. Dune Steep Novel Writing Month? Although it's a three month process. Basically, it's uh, Rish went to a, a writing symposium, I guess you could call it. And at this symposium, he watched somebody's talk about writing a novel in 90 days. And uh, the guy gave a kind of a uh, plan as to how you got to write your novel in 90 days. Uh, the first month of it is the prep month, which I thought was a really awesome idea. Giving yourself that, I mean, a whole month to prepare to write a novel. I'm always feeling like I'm slacking if I'm not doing that. Uh, if, if I'm not writing, I should say. If I am prepping and prepping and then I'm just like, well, I need to prep some more, I feel like I'm being lazy uh, and I should be writing already and, and then I'll jump into it and then I'll stall out because I wasn't prepared. So I think it's a cool thing to have that option to be able to do that. And now a professional writer has given me the... Uh, the option to do that so you know that's what I needed was somebody to tell me I could because I can't just make decisions on my own um, so yeah this month June is prep month I got to get my novel ready to go so that I can sit down and write it and not run into problems of not of uh, writer's block where I don't know what to do because I have an outline and I can just do what's in the outline um, and if you have an outline, I think you can know, you could skip ahead too if you wanted to. You know what I mean? If you're like not feeling this one scene one day, then you could skip ahead and write the scene that you are feeling and then come back to that one you weren't feeling later when you're more in the mood. Uh, so yeah, I gotta get started on that. Uh, I have a general idea, which is funny because Rish is actually jealous of me for having a general idea what I'm going to do. I keep trying to tell him that he needs to stop with the screenwriting ideas and just take his his ideas for movies and turn them into novels. And he keeps insisting that he can't do that. So, I don't know, maybe he'll be hating it because of that. But uh, my idea for this uh, thing is going to be called The Gauntlet. Okay? And it's kind of a superhero story of sorts. Uh, these two people uh, find or inherit, I should say, a gauntlet from a suit of armor. And the gauntlet, it turns out, is very, very old and comes from Knights of the Round Table and has been uh, enchanted by Merlin himself 
to give it certain extra powers. Um, and when they come in contact with this, well, it kind of changes their lives and causes them to do some, some different things that they wouldn't have done before. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of excited. There's a, a listener of the Doonstief whose name is Ramona Jones. And uh, when I first saw that person's name, uh, she donated to the show, and I saw that name, and I thought, oh, that's a cool name. That name sounds tough. That sounds like, it makes me think of, like, Cleopatra Jones or something like that. It needs to be, it would be a perfect name for a character, but it needs to be somebody who's kind of an ass kicker, you know? It can't just be any old story. Um, and I think I've finally come up with that story. I think uh, Ramona Jones is going to be the name of one of the main characters, and her brother Sebastian Jones will be the other character. Um, I could change it from Sebastian if you guys think, uh, if you know another Jones out there that I could name it after. Uh, maybe there's another listener of the show whose last name is Jones who would like to also have a character uh, named after them. Uh, give me a ring a ling a ding ding, you know? <laughs> Sorry. Drop me an email about it and uh, I'll consider it. Oh. Shoot. Uh, so yeah, that's the story I'm planning on writing. And um, a funny thing about this uh, contest, um, last month during my episode, I got a listener question. Uh, Mr. Rish Outfield, I, I think I'm saying that right, I'm not sure. Uh, anyways, yeah, it's, it's a more unusual name, and I, I, I don't know the guy, he's just a podcast listener, you know. Um... <laughs> Anyway, Mr. Rish Outfield uh, gave me a question about the show, and so I answered it, and then I requested questions from any other listeners that might have one if they wanted to just record themselves asking a question. I was down for answering it. Uh, interestingly enough, for once in my ever, somebody really did it. Uh, so I got another question for the show uh, this month. This time it's from listener Bria Burton. And uh, here's her question. Hi, Big. This is Bria, fan of the Ankle Cast, And I have a question. Uh, I'm in the car because I figured that was like all part of being able to get on the Ankle Cast was I needed to be in the car asking my question. So hopefully I'm doing everything right. Um, my question is about the novel writing you and Rish are going to be doing. And I just was wondering um, about your planning process. You talked a little bit about the idea you had. And I um, would love to hear both you and Rish, actually, but since this is your podcast and you threw him out of the car last time, um, I think I'll just have to hear from you because I'm guessing he's in the hospital, maybe? Anyway, so... Um, <clears throat> At some point, uh, would you just talk about what you're what you're doing um, in terms of your novel writing? Um, I really am fascinated by the plan you guys are following. Um, as a writer myself, I'm kind of a pantser, so it it takes me a long time to write things because I just fly by ideas without planning very much. So um, I really like that you guys are have this very solid plan of a month of figuring out what the novel's about, a month of writing it, and then I think the third one was, the third month is editing, but anyway, um, so I'd just like to hear you talk about your planning month. I know you're getting ahead of it as well, which is also pretty cool, because you're ahead going to be ahead of your game, so... I guess my overarching question would be, uh, what is this first step uh, process for you of planning? What program are you using? What kind of layout are you doing for your story? And the different, I how do you separate your ideas and put, put what is going where? And uh, even like how you're making time for it, um, that kind of thing. So I'd love to hear about that. And uh, hopefully other listeners would too. And you can put me down as uh, one of your future sales when when you're done with your book. I'm really looking forward to reading it. So, Bria Burton wants to know about the planning month. 
Um, and she recorded her question in her car. It's a good thing she did that because I wouldn't take a question if it weren't done in the car. No, actually, that's not true. I, I, I actually uh, would suggest you not record your question in the car because it's probably dangerous to do that. Um, and I'm probably doing something stupid recording a podcast in the car while I drive. And I don't want to uh, have you, you know, suing me when you crash your car because you were trying to record a question while driving. So you can just do it uh, when you're stopped at a stoplight or, you know, something like that. Um, yeah, Bria wants to know about how I'm going to go about this planning month thing. To tell you the truth, I'm not totally sure because, A, I have never done a novel before uh, that's larger than anything I've ever written. I think the longest thing I've written so far was something I wrote last, uh, I want to say August and September or so. I wrote a story called Do Over, which was about a guy who goes back in time uh, and changes his past only to have time tell him no. Um, And... uh, That one was 25,000 words, I think. And what I've always done for planning stuff is I will do a little bit of a a character study. Uh, I don't know if that's a good name for it, but we'll just call it that. Basically, I went through one time a few years ago and I made a giant list of questions for myself. And these are questions that are just about what the character's like, uh, all sorts of stuff. I mean, there's the general questions that you need to know, like what the character's birthday is, what their mom's name is, and their dad's name, and their brothers' and sisters' names, and, you know, the really general stuff that uh, you should know no matter what. And then there's some more in-depth things, things about what their biggest fears are, what... uh, you know, what the history of their life has been like, uh, those kind of things. And so usually I go through and I try to answer as many of these questions as I can. When it's a short story, I give up uh, a little earlier on than usual, probably. At least earlier on than you would if you were writing a novel, I guess, is probably a better way to say it. Because you're not only writing for so long about these characters, you don't have to know every dang, you know, which, how many of their underwear have skid marks in them and how many don't, that kind of thing. But when you're writing a novel, you need to know that stuff, um, because that's important. Uh, Anyways, so that's uh, thing number one, or one of the things that I do in preparation, and then usually for a short story or a shorter story, I'll do uh, what my screenwriting teachers called a step outline. The step outline is uh, the steps. Basically, it's kind of a list of scenes, really. It's like, you know, this is happening, this is happening, this happened, then this, then this, then this, and finally we get here. So it's a really kind of a bare-bones outline. That's what I usually do to get ready for a, a uh, short story. Um, now with this novel, I think I need to expand that a little bit. I did buy an ebook about writing outlines for novels. Um, and I read it through and uh, found it to be somewhat useful. Uh, it also had a chapter about questions that you should know about your character that you should ask. And I think I will go through and merge the questions from their thing in with the questions in mine so that my uh, characters are all the more rounded. Um, And it talks about different strategies that you can do to get your story in place, which is something that I need. Uh, I'm not really sure exactly how I'm going to get from one place to the next to the next in this story. I don't really know what all is going to happen in it. Um, I know how the story begins, 
and I know uh, an important thing that happens in the middle of the story. Um, I'm not sure, you know, what the end game is going to be. I, I would like this. This seems like it could be a good story for a series of books, which is supposed to be that holy grail that all writers are looking for, a series of novels that you can write so that people read it, and then they're like, oh, I've got to know what happens next. I'm going to go buy that one too. And so they buy that, and then, you know, you've earned yourself a fan or whatever, and they'll buy the stuff that you write when it comes out, and maybe they'll try your next series that you try out. Um, so most of the time, the ideas that I come up with are standalone novel kind of ideas. They wouldn't be the ideas that would... Uh, lend themselves towards series, although it seems to me like a lot of people will make things into a series as soon as whatever they get, when they get a good idea, or an idea that uh, resonates with people, I should say, one that sells a lot, then they'll just figure out a way to make that into a, a series. But this one, I think it could be a series right from the beginning, uh, which is cool. Uh, of course, I'm sure I'll screw it up and I'll have to rewrite the first book because it'll suck. Because, oh yeah, I suck. Wait, no I don't. I have confidence. I'm California big. And uh, so I believe in myself. Because um, I'm from California. Uh, anyways... So yeah, that's kind of the idea. I think I will make a similar to a step outline, but I think it'll be more in depth. Um, I don't know. Uh, I'm hoping it'll work out. My plan as to how I'm gonna do this, it's gonna be similar to what I'm doing right now. I have a lot of time driving to and from work. I have a 45 minute commute every day. And that's 45 minutes one way, so an hour and a half of every day I spend sitting in the car. Um, I've found that if I try to use that time to write or think about writing, as it were, uh, to plan writing, to, to work on that kind of stuff, I can't do it. I stop talking. Uh, I stop thinking about it. My mind wanders. But I've found a way around that. That is, if I turn on a recording device, plug in my mic, and start recording myself talking about a story, I will stick with it until my time runs out and I'm at work. And then I can do it again on the way home and again. So I think what I'm going to do is record myself trying to work out the way the story goes, and then... Uh, I will try and write down everything that I talked about. Not, I, I don't think I'll even actually listen to the recording unless there's something that I'm like, oh gosh, there was that one thing and I, I wish I could remember right now what it was, but instead I can't, so then maybe I'll play the recording and actually listen to it. The recording will be more to force myself to talk instead of letting my mind wander and stop and just scream at the guy who cut me off or whatever. So yeah, that's, that's what I plan to do, is just record myself talking about it and then writing down what I've talked about uh, at, uh, you know, at the end of the line when I get to wherever I'm going, whether it be work or home. Just quickly take notes on that before it uh, leaves my head, I guess. Um, and then if it does leave my head, I can use uh, the recording as a reference to go back and get it back in my head. So hopefully that answers your question, Bria. I hope I didn't shortchange you or whatever. Um, unfortunately, I don't have you here in my car like I managed to be able to just wrangle Rich into doing to, to say. So did that answer your question? Um, but maybe, you know, next time I can just have you come out from Florida and <laughs> sit here next to me while I talk. Uh, in a perfect world, um, there would be no place. But then it wouldn't be a world, because there would be no place, so I don't know. Anyhow, 
Uh, okay, so last month I gave y'all a story. And the story was so-so. But it was a story. It was, it was me doing something. Um, and I'm going to give you guys another story this month. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what I'm going to call it. I haven't totally decided yet. So I'm just going to say it's a story. And then when you hear the title, you'll see what I have finally decided on. But uh, yeah, I wrote this story. Uh, It's based on a line from a song by Sting. I'll talk a little bit more about it on the other end of the story. Uh, So here we go. This month's story. Hope you enjoy. Onward to the Breach by B.D. Anklevich. Screeching guitars pulled my consciousness forward from wherever it had been hiding. My phone jitterbugged its way along the nightstand, blaring rock music to wake me, until I grabbed it and slid my thumb across its screen to silence it. I sat up blearily and dropped my legs over the side of the bed. Everything was sore, despite the fact that I'd done no real exercise the day before. Must just be getting old. Part of the deal, I guess. I hobbled my way to the shower where the hot water did its best to help work the stiffness out of my muscles. I dried off and went to the closet. I had a lot of clothes hanging up there, but not many I could fit anymore. Couldn't breathe if I buttoned the top button on most of my shirts now. I should probably lose weight, I know. Then I wouldn't need the high blood pressure meds anymore and the doctor would stop hounding me about looming diabetes every time I came in to see him. But who would I turn to when things got tough if not for my comfort food? It's not like I have any friends anymore. Friends are for young men, I suppose. I grabbed my light blue shirt, then I noticed it had a big dollop of dried-on barbecue sauce just under the pocket. Damn. I'll need to get to the laundry soon, I guess. I grabbed my beige shirt, then remembered just how tight that one had been when I wore it last week, and instead opted for the white shirt I'd worn yesterday. It probably didn't smell too bad. I hadn't done anything strenuous in it or anything, and at least it fit okay. I grabbed the Sac State tie my kid had given me for Father's Day last year and my gray suit jacket and pants and got dressed. I was out of cereal and milk, too, for that matter. So breakfast was just a quick cup of coffee. And then I was on my way to the bus stop. Rain poured down from what had appeared to be a clear blue sky before I'd stepped out of the house. Apparently the cloud was straight above, but didn't extend to the horizon where I could have seen it. I ducked back into the house and grabbed my umbrella. I used to insist that I was too manly to carry an umbrella, but that's a luxury afforded only to those with a car. When you take the bus and the train to get to work, there's nowhere to hide. Showing up at work looking like a drowned rat a few times made me realize that I had to swallow my pride and get something. Not a lot of options for a manly umbrella. Most everything was pink or paisley or Hello Kitty. At least plain black was one of the choices at the Walmart. The bus was dry, but only in one sense of the word. Water wasn't falling from the sky in there, but it was so muggy, but it was so muggy that I probably wound up wetter from the humidity than any rain could ever have made me. I played Candy Crush on my phone as I tried to ignore the sweat building on my forehead and threatening to drip in my eyes. It occurred to me that my choice of game was ironic when a man so overweight he made my own bulging belly look like a mere obesity starter kit took the seat next to me and pinned me tightly against the wall of the bus. Now the sweat started to build along my whole left side, everywhere his body came in contact with mine. It felt like a presidential pardon had been mandated for me when the bus finally made it to the train station and the end of the line. Another 30 minutes on light rail, and the train dropped me a block and a half from the office. I saw Kelly McMillan at the receptionist's desk on the way in, and couldn't help but walk a bit slower to take a gander. She was so damn beautiful, young, vivacious, thin, but busty. She'd been working the front desk for close to six months now, and her smile, her face, 
Her cascade of fiery red curly hair was the highlight of each day for me. Maybe someday I'd work up the courage to talk with her, but, well, probably not. What would an angel like her want with someone like me? A fat 45-year-old divorcee living alone in a rundown studio apartment in Del Paso Heights. She'd never even consider giving me a chance. But at least I could admire her from afar. At my desk, I plugged in my headset and started taking calls. The fluorescent tubes cast everything in a stark greenish tinge, as if the scene needed anything extra to make it more depressing. A three-hour stream of calls poured in with one question after another. I'd been here so long that I never saw anything new. I knew how to answer each and every one of them, because I'd been faced with them dozens upon dozens of times. I suppose a lot of people would find the work tedious and dull. I never have. It's something I'm competent at. I'm the master of my domain. I can do it and do it well. And what with the way the rest of my life tends to go, it's nice to have that feeling once in a while. At lunch, I slipped out and walked to the McDonald's down the street. I always stick to the dollar menu, or the value menu, I guess it's called now, since there's only a few things that only cost a dollar anymore. Because my paycheck goes to other things, so I don't have the money for a nice big combo meal. Kelly was looking beautiful on my way out and offered me the usual glowing smile she tenders everyone with. But on the way back in, she didn't. She saw me, I'm pretty sure, but she quickly looked away. And I think her eyes were kind of red, too. I wished I could have asked her what was wrong, but I knew that would be really weird. After all, I've never talked to her once. I don't know her. Surely she wouldn't appreciate some stranger sticking his nose into her personal business, no matter how kindly I meant to be. Instead, I hurried up to my desk and went back to the incoming calls. At day's end, Kelly seemed to have gotten over whatever problem she might have had earlier. She smiled at me as I passed through the lobby. She was getting up from her chair and gathering her things, heading home herself now. Her legs were exquisite things to look at, perched above tall high heels, wrapped in black leggings, and perfectly proportioned. I wondered how much time she spent in the gym to look so flawless. Maybe I ought to go to the gym sometime. My doctor sure seemed to think I should, but the idea didn't appeal to me much. Maybe if I knew Kelly would be there, but she wouldn't. She surely didn't live anywhere near me, not in my hood. My last moment of zen for the day passed me by. I was out the door and Kelly was no longer in sight. It was on to the train, then to the bus, then walking home in the steady drizzle from that sad sack cloud that just wouldn't go away. I noticed my arm getting wet and realized that one of the spokes of my umbrella no longer connected to the fabric on the end. I also noticed, looking at the wet spot on my sleeve, that I had managed to drip a glob of ketchup on my shirt from my cheeseburger that I'd had at lunch. I'd probably ought to head to the laundromat this evening, but all I really wanted to do was get some Chinese and watch Netflix until I was too tired to even head to my bed. My couch was only ten steps or so from my bed, but I'd still spent quite a few nights on the couch all the same. It was a comfortable couch, at least. I grabbed Chinese on the way to my building and spent the evening with Chandler, Monica, Ross, Rachel, Joey, and Phoebe. Netflix had recently made Friends available for streaming, and I'd been working my way from season 1 to season 10. Each night, the show took me back to some good times. At least I remember them as being good times, anyways. I was in season 6 now. Maybe it was the MSG and the orange chicken. Or maybe it was just a more difficult day than I'd thought. But soon enough, I dropped off to sleep on the couch, just like I thought I might. As I was fading out, I decided that tomorrow night, I'd have to do the laundry. I awoke in the straps of my saddle and harness. The wind whipped my hair about my face as I slowly came to full consciousness. My muscles ached from being in the saddle the whole night through. Ah, the captain wakes, a voice spoke in my mind. It belonged to my steed upon which I sat, 
the great eagle, Kron da Golden Feather, to whom I have been telepathically linked since finding him as a hatchling when I was but a lad. We arrive at the land of the Bice soon, my friend, Kron said within my head. Get your wits about you, for the battle will be joined soon. I sat up and stretched my limbs as best I could from within the saddle straps. I shook my head to rid my mind of the cobwebs that still clung from my dream. Zebas! A voice shouted from above me and to the right. I glanced up and found my lifelong friend, Song Lark, flying astride his griffin, named the black heart of darkness from which no life nor light can escape in the fearsome custom of griffin naming rites. I see you have awakened. Never have I known a more fearless warrior than you, Zebas, one that can sleep so soundly and peacefully in the saddle on the eve of battle. What other sleeps late with such a day before him? I say to you, none. No man. Good morrow to you, Zebas. Good morrow, I said in response. I definitely felt more subdued than Song Lark, but shouting a conversation from Great Eagle back to Griffin back left no opportunity to communicate as much with my tone. The dream still clung to me and filled me with a strange melancholy. I had the strangest dream, Song Lark. It was so strange, I shouted above the wind. Did you now? He chuckled. <laughs> How many bice did you slay in your dream? Were your boots sodden with the blood of those monsters? No, I called back. It was not like that. I dreamed that I was in another realm. One filled with wonders. There were great metal beasts and huge metal snakes as well that devoured people, then carried them far afield before vomiting them forth again unharmed. And, and, and men had magic windows that showed them the foibles and failings in the lives of other men. And... Oh, and every person carried a stone that could magically bring the voice of others to them from afar. Oh, yes, and, and women most fair with, with painted faces that display not merely a bit of ankle, but their entire shapely leg. This does sound like a dream most strange indeed, Zebas, Song Lark shouted. Strange, but certainly wondrous. Aye, it should have been wondrous. And yet, it was not. Neither I, nor any man or woman I met in my travels, seemed to be happy when surrounded by such miracles and marvels. It left me feeling somber and pensive, very strange indeed. Well, my man, the bice approach. Soon we will be wading in their entrails. I think it wise you forget this dream and gird your loins with fortitude, lest you find those monsters wading in your entrails instead. Song Glark drew his sword and held it aloft. Onward to the breach, strong-armed Zebas. I smiled and shook my head again to clear the dregs of that vision from my mind. I drew my sword in response to his salute. The smell of the oil I nightly polished its blade with tickled my nose, and the sun glinted off its razor-sharp point. Onward to the breach, merciless Song Galark. So yeah, there you go. That's the story. Um, it was based on this line from, from a Sting song called When the Angels Fall from his album uh, Soul Cages, um, which is probably his best album, although sometimes I like to say uh, 
Nothing Like the Sun is his best album. Uh, Rich doesn't agree with me. We're both big Sting fans. I think we did a whole episode once about him on That Gets My Goat. And uh, people probably skipped that one, but we're both big Sting fans anyways. And uh, really like his stuff. Um, I have a hard time trying to decide between which one's the best. Uh, whether it's Nothing Like the Sun or Soul Cages. But I do really like Soul Cages. When the Angels Fall isn't about what I wrote about, but there is a line in there when he says, Perhaps the dream is dreaming us astride the backs of eagles. So I thought, okay, that's an interesting concept. Just the idea that what if this world is the dream? And where we go in our heads at night is the real world. Um, It doesn't really hold up because, you know, people don't dream every night and they don't, uh, they don't do that kind of stuff. But it's still kind of a fun idea. And of course, being astride the back of an eagle just had to be uh, part of the image. I don't know. I think that's a really neat uh, image. It's a little Tolkien-esque, which uh, sucks, because I hate seeming derivative. But I'm not derivative of Tolkien, okay? I'm derivative of Sting. So there. <laughs> but yeah, that's the story for this month. Um, we'll see if I can do one for next month. I think I could probably fit in one. I mean, it's really it's one day of writing. It's a, it's a quickie thing. It's something that I can do uh, relatively quick. And this next month, I'm supposed to be just planning. So I could probably fit in one day of writing at some point. But I've got, got to also come up with a, a little idea, if you know what I'm saying. One that's drabble-worthy or... T- t- what do they call it again? Uh, flash fiction-worthy. Um, because, uh, yeah, that's, that's really all that I have time to put together for this show. Um, well, I will try. I will try to have another story for you next month. You know, I I mentioned it last month saying, hey, here's a story, and maybe if you guys like it, I'll try and do one every month. And I got a couple of comments of people saying, yeah, do one every month, please. And I think Marshall Latham even uh, volunteered to produce it for me, um, which he always does because he's such a good guy. Uh, so, you know, thanks, Marshall. That's really awesome of you to offer. Uh, someday I may actually get it done ahead of time enough <laughs> that we can do that. <laughs> we'll see. Um, but anyways... I'm going to try to get you guys another story for next time. Um, And it's good to have writing exercises, you know, just something to write about. Maybe I'll do something like that next time around, is uh, just give myself three random words from out uh, uh, out of a hat. I wonder if there's such thing as random word generator on the internet. I bet you there is. There's everything on the internet. But, uh, yeah, maybe I'll try and do that and come up with an idea that goes with it. But anyways, um, so that's my story for this month. Hope you guys had fun with it. Hope you liked it a little. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, I didn't talk much about what I did this last month because it was mostly a lot of nothing. I kept uh, thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm able to get a jump start on the planning but I don't have to because I have next month and so I wound up doing very little. I did do a couple of days where I started talking about the gauntlet and uh, what I was going to do with that story and I thought about it. Um, So there's that and now the time is upon me so there's no more effing around. I've got to get to it and get working on it. And so that's what I'm going to do. Hopefully, I can get myself a a good uh, outline put together faster than one month. I think it's possible. 
but I don't really know because I've never done it before for a novel. So I don't know how in depth it's got to be. Um, the way the thing is supposed to be is you plan for one month and then you write for two. And uh, you're supposed to write the NaNoWriMo amount of words, but do it for two months instead of just one. So. 1,666 words every day for two months will get you 100,000 words, I guess, because I get you 50,000 words if you do it during NaNoWriMo. So I'm not sure how long this book is going to be, uh, if it'll be 100,000 words, probably more than I expect it to run. So I may not have to do 1,666 um, maybe I'll just do 666. 603 score and 6. Um, but, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, the, uh, I think the idea uh, behind, you know, Bria did ask about the months... And whether, uh, you know, it was writing for a month, rewriting for a month uh, after that, but it's apparently supposed to be writing for two months. And uh, following Heinlein's rules, you don't rewrite. Heinlein says no. Only rewrite at the request of an editor and if you agree with it. Uh, so, well, it's just fix typos, fix, I guess, obvious errors of continuity. Um, and so forth, and then put it out there. Uh, don't, don't wait, don't bog yourself down in rewriting. And I think that's, you know, kind of the difference between the way Bria works, because she said she was a pantser, which, uh, if you don't know, that means, you know, she, she doesn't plan ahead. She just kind of writes by the seat of her pants. She, uh, just you know, comes up with it as she goes. But what happens with that is that sometimes you write yourself into a corner or sometimes what you came up with one day was crap or whatever. Because you didn't plan ahead, you, you know, you, you don't have exactly what you feel that you want. And so it requires more rewriting. So hopefully, we'll see if that actually works out. Hopefully the idea is, because I did a big awesome one month long outline I won't need to go back and do serious rewrites um what's his face Dean Wesley Smith says that uh, when you really follow Heinlein's rules your writing can really take off and so I'm going to try to do that uh rule number one you must write so I will start with that. Anyways, um, yeah, so that's coming up. And uh, that's a lot of words to write each day. That's kind of a two-hour commitment per day. So I'm going to have to really put some, some work into it. The good thing is my kids are out of school. And so I don't have to get up at 6.30 and help them get ready and get all their crap and make their lunches for them. Because if I don't make it for them, they'll just go without a lunch and then they'll buy a lunch at school using their account, which has no money in it, and goes into arrears. Or they'll just go and they don't have money and they'll go hungry, which sucks too. Like, why? Why do kids do that? Why do they purposefully not make a lunch, even though there's food in the fridge for lunches and they'll just go and not have anything and they'll just sit there and they'll like look at other people's food with puppy dog eyes and crap you want to hear the worst thing ever my my <laughs> my son admitted to this to my wife he said that when he didn't have lunches at school he would just wait for people to eat their lunch and then walk away and leave what's left and, like, if they had an apple or something that they didn't touch, he would grab it and eat it. And I was just like, oh, my gosh. <sighs> I guess that's 
kind of nice because he doesn't let food get wasted. I've heard of people called freegans. <laughs> and these are people who will only eat food that is free. Um, so they'll go to places where they're going to throw out their old food and ask them for it. And I, I, They may actually dumpster dive. I'm not sure what exactly a freegan does. But I've heard about them, and uh, I think we actually did a story about them at work one time. A story about freegans and how they would get their food all for free. And it wasn't because they stole it. They <laughs> got it for free. Just like my son, who apparently is a budding freegan. Um, but yes, so school is over. It's officially over. Uh, two days ago was the last day. And so I don't have to get the kids up in the morning. I don't have to help them do anything. I can get up at 6.30 and just go right. And that's my plan. I'm going to do that every day. Um, and uh, I'm hoping that I'll be able to get in the time that I need to get this novel written over the summer. I'm really excited about it. I think it's going to be cool. It's going to be a neat experience, even if the novel turns out to suck, which, you know, that's the way it often is. Uh, your first novel just isn't good and you know people people expect that so I'm gonna expect that I'm gonna expect that it's terrible but I'm gonna do it so then I can do a second one that's maybe a little better and then a third one that's maybe a little better and so on um, because uh, unlike Rish I've given up any any aspirations toward movies and screenwriting um, so all my ideas are either short stories or novels. And uh, maybe they would be better as screenplays. I don't know, but I don't care. Because they're not going to be screenplays. I don't write screenplays. Screenplays are going nowhere. It's one thing that Rish and I have both learned. A screenplay is dead. It's worthless. Unless somebody actually buys it and makes it a movie. When they do that, then it's something. But until that, it's just a dang blueprint. A blueprint for an unmade building, which is totally worthless. Um, so I've totally put that idea out of my mind. And, uh, yeah. <sighs> I'm excited to go for it. I think it's going to be cool. Um, and another thing that I can do this month of planning... Uh, when I wake up at 6.30 in the morning, I can get in some exercise walking on the treadmill and use my mic again to record myself as I walk, planning about how, to, how this story is going to go. So, all in all, it's going to be awesome. So there you go, folks. Um, come to the end of my commute. It's time for me to go to work. <laughs> and... Uh, that means time for the show to end. So, y'all have a good month. Thanks for listening to the Ankle Cast and, uh, and for supporting me and for helping me feel like uh, I can do it. Um, because, you know, dreams don't come true, dreams are made true. So, gotta get out there and get them made because your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. Congratulations. Today is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. Your goal should be a dream with a deadline. That's why I gave you five years. Do it! You miss 100% of the shots you never take. Take the shot. There will always be things in the way you dream. Don't let your dreams be dreams. You go out and you find why not. You surround yourself with why not. Live a why not life, man. Yeah.
in knows. But all you need is one yes. Where we are today is where we are. Today's the starting day. I know what we're going to do today. Just do it! And will you succeed? Yes, you will indeed. 98 and three quarters percent guaranteed. That's all it takes to be successful is an attitude. It's an awesome feeling when you truly believe that you're going to be successful. Nothing is impossible. Dreams don't come true. Dreams are made true. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. Storm in the castle. Think it'll wait? It would take a miracle. Bye-bye. Bye.